Number 10, the Smello Vision. Oh, this is bad. We've come a long way since the dawn of filmmaking. Imagine all of your movies costing five cents and all in black and white with no sound. Ooh, what a time to be alive. Today, obviously, we have color, sound, virtual reality, and those moving boxes of the movies, which honestly, I'm not crazy about. I they shake too much, I'm not, I'm not a big fan. Same with the 3D, those, those glasses that we used to wear, we don't really do the 3D anymore, it was bad. Anyway, some people think that's not enough. Some people want more. Enter the smell vision created by a man named Hans Lüb. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that just writes itself, doesn't it? The idea is that while you are watching a movie, you can smell the smells on screen. A field of grass, a car chase with burning rubber, a breakfast scene. Mm. My issue is what happens if I leave the smell vision on and and I fall asleep on the couch and reruns of Dirty Jobs comes on. Ooh, yucky. Or better yet, you guys have a smell of vision and you're watching my bloopers. Uh oh, stinky. That wouldn't be very good, would it? Number nine, Damascus Steel. While off on the Crusades, a lot of Europeans came into contact with things they'd never seen before. Spices, for example. Please cut it with the bland food, guys, please. Another thing they saw were warriors who wielded blades that could slice through floating handkerchiefs but also bend to ridiculous degrees without breaking. These blades were made from what was called Damascus steel. But for some reason, we actually have no idea what these blades were actually made of or what the process for making it could even be. Some people think it could have been made by mixing iron with plant matter, which could have given the kind of flexibility I'll never have. But we don't know what plant matter and we don't even know for sure that's how it was done. Best guess is that it was made of crucible steel, which <laughs> can I just say sounds really cool. But that's just a theory. Uh, wait, that's the wrong channel. Number eight, the Voynich Manuscript. This may be a little bit insensitive of me, but the drawings in the Voynich Manuscript kind of look like the same things I used to doodle in my notebooks when I stopped paying attention in class. I definitely never wrote like that though. The Voynich manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, who was a Polish collector and bookseller in 1912 when he acquired the manuscript. It's from around the 15th century and is written in this really cool looking code with strange drawings. The font actually kind of reminds me of the font from Lord of the Rings. Does anyone else see that or am I, am I weird? A lot of the pictures drawn in the book seem to be plants. But then you get the random page that has a string of what looks like pregnant women and you're back to square one. I don't know, but I'm still going with somebody's encrypted notebook with fun doodles for when they're bored. Number seven, Ulfbort swords. How do you make a sword that your society did not have the technology for? That is an excellent question and it is the question that Viking Ulfbert swords pose to historians. The problem with Ulfbert swords is that the technology required for making them did not appear until about 800 years later. Now the thing that kind of bothers me with that assumption is we are assuming that it didn't appear until 800 years later because we haven't found evidence to prove otherwise, except for the swords themselves. In Viking society, a lot of stuff was made with wood and other degradable things, which makes it really hard to know too much about the ancient peoples. What's really interesting is how a Viking sword bearing an Arabic inscription was found. Perhaps these swords were made with Damascus steel, the recipe for which was given to the Vikings through trade, maybe? We need more evidence to know for sure. Number six, Baghdad battery. Do you know how a battery works? Allow me to explain. I don't really know. Um, what I do know is that it involves chemistry. Google tells me the chemical reactions in a battery involve the flow of electrons from one material to another through an external circuit. I don't know. We often think of batteries as a moderately modern invention. And for the most part, that's true. But then there's the Baghdad battery. The Baghdad battery, or batteries because there are a bunch of them, were discovered outside modern day Baghdad in Iraq in 1936. And it's basically a clay pot with a copper cylinder inside of it. Inside the copper cylinder was an iron rod held in place with asphalt. Now, if you take an electrolyte liquid like like even grape juice or something, and put it in the pot, the pots now become batteries, generating about two volts of electricity. The crazy thing about this is that they were found in a Paleolithic village, which is like the Stone Age. We have absolutely no idea what the electricity was used for, but probably because it's fun to administer minor electrical shocks to yourself, right? Number five, Iron Pillar. 
The iron pillar of Delhi is, well, it's pretty self-explanatory actually. It's, it's an iron pillar, which is more than 1,600 years old. I leave my bike out in the rain for like three days and it's a rusty pile of junk. But this thing has been out in the open for all those years and it never gained a single speck of rust. How the heck is that possible? I don't know. None of us actually know. Some people think it might have to do with the climate in Delhi. As if it was just in the perfect spot to not rust. But then others think it has to do with the phosphorus and absence of sulfur and manganese in the iron. Plus its size. I don't know, my pea-sized brain won't be able to tell you the answer, but it certainly is a puzzling one. Number four, Chinese seismoscope. At first glance, I can confidently say that I would not assume this was the seismoscope. It was basically a big old pot with a bunch of dragons around the outside that would symbolize each direction on a compass. And when an earthquake would happen, the dragon that represented the direction the quake came from would spit out a ball into a bronze toad's mouth. Now, apart from bronze dragons spitting balls into bronze frog mouths, this is an extremely sophisticated device. And absolutely no one knows how it works. We have guesses about what could do it, but this thing can detect the direction of earthquakes 400 miles away. That's insane. And they still made it into a work of art. I am impressed. Good show, good show. Number three. Antikythera mechanism. I kinda hate when people think complex things in history had to be because of aliens. Just because these people were ancient does not mean that they were stupid. They just didn't have the vast amounts of shared knowledge we have now. Then you show me the Antikythera mechanism and all I can think is aliens. This thing was probably built around the second century BC and it had the capability of calculating and displaying things like the phases of the moon and the lunisolar calendar which is just crazy. We know that people did study that, and gear-based tech like this had actually been a thing for a long, long time before it. We think of computers as modern things, but there were machines capable of doing calculations before electricity and computer chips. Some of us have to start giving these ancient civilizations more credit instead of just jumping to aliens or to time travel. Number two, Roman dodecahedron. Dodecahedron, dodecahedron. 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 Oh, what? Oh, yeah, sorry, I got a video to make. Uh, here, look at this thing. This is a Roman dodecahedron. And guess what? We have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to do. But we do know that Europe has tons of these, and they all date back to the Roman era. Like all dodecahedra, it has 12 sides, and each side has a differently sized hole. They also have strange bulbs on each corner. They would range in sizes too, being anywhere from four to 11 centimeters. I'm honestly stumped about what it could be. People have theorized they could be uh, paperweights, toys, candle holders, dice, or even a thing used to measure finger sizes for rings. Let me know what you think it could be. Number one, Easter Island. If you thought this point was gonna be about the huge statues on the island, well, think again. While those statues are a mystery all on their own, this point is actually gonna be about Rongo Rongo. What the heck is Rongo Rongo? Well, Rongo Rongo is possibly a form of ancient writing. What makes it stand apart is that it is almost nothing like any other form of writing from any other culture in the world, at least that we know of. Look at this really handy dandy rock that's covered in the writing. Can you make anything out of it? Apparently, the symbols are based on Polynesian religious motifs. My brain is just a, a smidge too slow to get any kind of information out of it. It just makes me really wish I had a secret language, you know? Number 10, Greek fire. You know what's scary? Fire. You know what's even scarier than that? Someone who can shoot streams of fire at you. While some people love the smell of napalm in the morning, they are usually the people doing the firing. And it wasn't just shirtless Americans who did the firing, no. Somehow, the ancient Greeks also used a proto-napalm that would be used against other ships in naval warfare. The substance would apparently cling to flesh and was impossible to extinguish with water. What puzzles us is that the recipe for Greek fire was never told to anyone. It was a secret on the same level as the Krabby Patty secret formula. People have experimented with different ingredients that the Byzantine Empire had access to. 
The Mythbusters, my favorite scientists, used naphtha, which is made from a light crude oil, mixed with pine resin, and they burned down a ship in a few seconds. I'm sure at the time, people thought that those who used Greek fire were wielding the power of a god or something. Number 9. T for men. Winding the clock back to the 1800s, you'll find pictures of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And these distinguished gentlemen have the fullest and thickest mustaches ever grown by man. Much care is needed to maintain such a manly image. So when an established gentleman goes for his morning tea, it would be rather unfortunate to get his mustache wet and ruin his dashing good looks. An invention of the 1800s beckons to solve this issue with the mustache cup. Mustache cups were invented so the chivalrous men of the day didn't ruin their grooming rituals with a cup of Earl Grey tea. The cups had a small porcelain mouthpiece with a smaller hole for drinking, while the main piece would protect the stash. It may sound ridiculous, but it almost looks like a modern travel mug. So maybe they were onto something. Number 8. Nightmare Story I don't know about you guys, but no matter how you present them, dolls are just creepy. Have you ever noticed that when someone has a creepy doll, it's never just one? There's always a bunch of them for some reason. I, I don't know, I wouldn't want the room to feel safe or welcoming after all. <laughs> one man in 1871 said, I know, let's make them even creepier by having them move themselves. The creeping doll, as it was called, was a doll-like automaton that had clock-like gears to simulate real human movement with the addition of hidden wheels underneath to aid in the doll moving across the floor. Because, you know, the last thing I need is this doll creeping into my bed at night. Whew. Number 7. Gee, this cane is heavy. As people began to settle down after imperial monarchies went the way of the dodo bird, it was a good idea in everyone's best interest to limit people carrying weapons. If people didn't have swords, it could make another revolution a little less bloody. But what's that I hear from upper class wealthy people who don't want to listen to the rules that they make? Well, how about concealed and hidden swords? Yep, that's right. Cane swords were a popular fashion accessory in the 19th century. As carrying swords fell out of fashion, royal men needed to take swords with them for self-defense. Or so they thought. Even women were concealing these hidden bladed inventions and parasols. However, it was socially unacceptable for a woman to have such possessions, let alone have the ability to know such training. As time went on, the hidden compartments that held blades were replaced with my personal favorite item, a flask. Number 6. Look at all these cool chickens. Let's face it, we all went through our awkward phases in life. And if you didn't live through the early 2000s as a youth, then bands like Linkin Park and My Chemical Romance just don't hit as hard. So when trying to find the weirdest inventions of the 1800s, I felt like closing my bedroom door and playing Green Day as I dye my hair because I'm super serious about how I feel. Why do I feel this teenage angst you ask? Well, that's because there's rose tinted glasses for chickens. Yeah. And they're cooler than me. Ugh. Yeah, little tiny eyeglasses for chickens. but. They actually have a good use. They were designed to prevent pecking and cannibalizing other chickens. Ooh. The theory goes that if a chicken was wearing rose tinted glasses, he couldn't distinguish between blood and what wasn't. That way they wouldn't attack each other. Yet another heartwarming comfort from the 1800s. Number 5. I'm coming out of this hole, partner. We enjoy many luxuries in the 21st century. Warm houses, everyday appliances, and the freedom to shout profanities at strangers on the internet you slightly disagree with, but you give them the business anyway because it's been a bad week and you deserve it. But probably what we should all be thankful for is modern medicine. Back in the 1800s, it just wasn't where it is today. A great example of that is safety coffins. A truly grim situation. A medical doctor has declared you dead. Now you are being buried alive. Have no fear friends, because you had enough money for a safety coffin. The coffin contained a device or means of various designs which was to alert the living of your mistaken burial and hopeful resurrection. The very rational fear of being buried alive most likely was spun from fiction and news at the time with the occasional case happening here and there. However, I'm of the opinion it should be a never ever kind of thing. Yeah, no thanks. Number 4. Your bad hair day has just been terminated. Oh to live in a time of industrial revolution where machines go and go. I'm sure that all this heavy industry won't enable bad practices of corporations and usher in the destruction of our environment. Pfft. No sir! This is the age of machines. And if machines can help with one thing, it most certainly can aid in another. May I introduce you the rotary hairbrush. Why brush your own hair when an overcomplicated machine can do it for you? At the time, it kind of made sense. 
Machines felt like they were the way of the future. They were kind of right, but at this rate, everything in the home would have intricate pulleys or a steam engine attached. Steampunk, anyone? Number three, full of air. The Industrial Revolution changed the world. We can't deny that. That can also be said for the steam trains. But what about pneumatic powertrains? Back in the 1800s, a man named Alfred Eli Beach came up with such a design. Prior testing had proven useful enough to build a larger demonstration in New York. So he built a tunnel to test his air power train. It only ran a short distance, but the train held 22 people and was controlled by a roots blower nicknamed the Western Tornado. That was also my nickname in high school. Sadly, the project didn't receive much support from the government at the time and other methods for trains eventually took over. Unfortunate because it sounds like Alfred Eli Beach was very dedicated to the project, as he put up a very large sum of money to the project. The tunnel that housed the short train the tunnel that housed the short train line was completed in 58 days. While he did have bigger plans for his train, it kind of just became an amusement for people. It was shortly shut down thereafter. But 58 days, that's pretty quick. I'd like to see that happen in a major city now. No way it's happening. Number two, get on my mongoose, bro. Looking at the Motor Scout, you can see the beginnings of what could be a four wheeler. Personally, I think it looks like a mongoose from Halo, but mom thinks I play too many games. Designed by F.R. Sims in the late 1890s, it was never really meant for off-road terrain, instead to support infantry on smooth roads. Sims understanding the annoyance of trying to ride your motorized quad cycle while someone is firing at you, placed a Maxim machine gun on the quad to return fire. Which is strange, because usually these things require a team of soldiers to operate. He also added an iron shield for a little extra protection. It is too bad the next major conflict would have a lack of usable roads and more trenches than anything else. While it never did see combat, it was somewhat useful and would later inspire Sims to design the first armored car. Number one. Bro, trust me. Everyone has a favorite article of clothing. For sports fans out there, it could be a lucky jersey. But back in the 1800s, there was an article of clothing no British soldier could be without. The cholera belt. What does a cholera belt do exactly? Well, it helps to prevent cholera. I've got good sources bro, trust me. The running not so scientific theory at the time was that any abdominal issues and sickness was caused by a chilly belly. So simply make your tummy warm and voila, cholera has been prevented. British soldiers in India were often given the belts unaware of the biohazard that was an epidemic. The belts were just flannel that basically wrapped around you. It's a good thing we're not superstitious today and would never buy into such ridiculousness. Hey man, did uh, my order of healing crystals come in? I'm getting some bad voodoo vibes at home lately, man. I totally need to cleanse that space, bro. Number 10, the bullet mousetrap. You might have heard me say that and said, what? Which is exactly what I said when I saw a mousetrap. That's main killing potential was to fire a lead slug Minuteman style at a small rodent. It is no exaggeration to say that the difference between this mousetrap and a musket is that a musket weighs a little bit more. The mousetrap was loaded just like a traditional musket of the time, with black powder, a lead ball, and even a percussion cap. In all honesty, I'm not sure how you go about defending this mousetrap. Textbook definition of overkill. Also, you know, there's a loaded firearm in the house with a hair trigger that a small rodent could set off by gently grazing it. I like to imagine a fun family game of, do I no longer have a sister or was that just a mouse, after hearing a small musket fire inside the home. I also had to mention that while the immediate danger of a 32 caliber lead ball finding a new home in your stomach is frightening enough, black powder being black powder is very volatile and produces a lot of energy. Fire hazard. Smokey the fire safety dog does not approve. Number 9, the virtual boy. This one's just crazy. I doubt many people would remember this and in Nintendo's defense they usually know what they're doing. Well most of the time. Usually. There's so many remasters that they could do. It's a license to print money. I don't know why they don't. Come on Nintendo, I'm waiting for it. The Virtual Boy, however, oh boy. I wouldn't expect many to have seen it since the sales were poor. The Virtual Boy was a 32-bit portable console that was basically a headset, except, you know, there's no straps to put it around your head, but a stand so you can play games on it while laying prone? Yeah, I'm not sure. My back hurts just looking at it. Just doesn't make a lot of sense. The main selling point was the graphics. It was a big topic back in the 90s. The Virtual Boy was capable of 3D, which was huge for the time, way ahead of its time. Except it was stereographic 3D and monochrome red. Everything was just shades of red. So watching footage of the gameplay gives me a headache as I'm sure playing it would. So I can see why laying on your living room floor playing this, well, it sucks. Number eight, the black powder mousetrap, mice. 
They're everywhere, and they suck. At least the wild ones. Some people got cute pets. So we place mouse traps to get rid of them. However, sometimes we get our fingers cut, which also sucks. Oh man, it hurts really bad. Or if you're a friend of Johnny Knoxville, it hurts all over. They, they do a lot of weird stuff with mouse traps. Love those guys. However, one design of mouse trap I think is the worst because it could potentially end your life is the black powder mouse trap. It was essentially just like ye olde cannons of the time. Black powder, big iron ball, except just on a much tinier scale. And in the house, because you know, having a cannon go off in the house is a great idea. Sure, let's just have that. that. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Number seven, the baby cage. Living in large cities can be difficult. Toronto being the third largest in North America, well, I can relate. It's crazy we're that big. Things get busy even in the suburbs here. There's a hustle and a bustle that small cities and towns just don't get. Now, back in the early 20th century, this was still the case, except there wasn't the same emphasis on park life, biking, and enjoying what fresh air actually is in the city like there is in modern cities today. We've done better since then. And there's nothing more important than fresh air for babies. So that's why in the 1920s, the baby cage was invented. Basically, it was a wire cage that hangs out of your fifth floor apartment window, like that massive AC unit that hasn't worked properly since McDonald's ran out of Szechuan sauce. Obviously, I don't need to tell you why this is a bad idea, and not too long after, it was outlawed. It's just don't, don't, that's high up, it could drop, yeah, no, bad idea, not a good idea. Number six, this one's for the older crowd, the Ford Pinto. Remember those bad boys? I never had the pleasure of being in one or owning one myself, but I swear to God, every time my family got together, the men would sit around and talk about cars that they own. It's kind of a man thing to do, I guess, even though they all had the same conversation the last time, which is just like only a couple months ago. And one model that always comes up is the Ford Pinto. Today, cars get recalled all the time, but in the age of affordable family vehicles and quality, the Ford Pinto stood out, especially because there was a chance the Pinto could burst into flames, which is arguably the worst thing a car could do. Besides not work, I'd argue not working is better than bursting into flames. A few other major issues really set back what I think is a very sleek and appealing vehicle to both mom and dad and the family. Number five, the spaghetti fork. Make sure you put my special spaghetti fork on the table. I need to eat my pasta and gabagool. Italians and lovers of the best cuisine on earth, in my opinion, I love Italian cuisine, get ready to cringe. The twirling spaghetti fork is a battery operated fork that twirls when you push a button, so you no longer suffer the burden of twirling your own spaghetti. Listen, I'm a big dude, I'm lazy, I love staying in after a long week of work and playing video games, probably my favorite thing to do. Yeah, sometimes I order in because I don't feel like getting up, but not twirling mom's spaghetti? Come on, twirling the spaghetti that, I argue that's the best part. No dinner with no no should require double A batteries, in my opinion. I'm just saying. You bring a fork. Why you bring us a fork? Number four, hydrogen blimps. It really must have been something to witness humans gaining flight. Something so previously impossible was now not only possible, but something that you had to pay money for, which is how you know it was very successful. Large jumbo jets full of croc wearing tours headed to slob attractions was still a thing of the future. We're not there yet. This is still the early 1900s. We'll get there. So how do we get people to places in large numbers and still manage to be opulent? Said a bunch of people in the early 1900s. Airships, said Germany, who took the blimp game to the next level. However, a lot of these blimps made a cut in their design, if you will. To help save on money, the airships were filled with the much more cheaper hydrogen, which in large quantities is extremely volatile. The Hindenburg is a great example. Well, we could fill it with a safe fuel, uh, but it's really expensive, but we could fill it with the fuel that could destroy the whole thing, and that's like 10 times cheaper. Well, I'll fill it with that then, why would you not? Number three, flying car. Maybe it's because we love the idea of breaking new ground, setting precedents, or we really just want to live with the Jetsons. It was a cool cartoon. The Mizar flying car was designed by a group of engineers in the early 1970s, using the very famous Ford Pinto, like previously mentioned, because, well, it sucks on the ground, so it's gotta be good in the sky, right? Right, that makes sense. Well, no. Besides the mechanical issues, it would be a hard sell as, well, you know, the average American doesn't have flying experience or not to mention a runway in their backyard. Plus, we have trouble with drones today. Imagine if it was raining Ford Pintos. Yikes. Mom, there's another Ford Pinto in the living room. It wouldn't, it wouldn't go very well, would it? No. Number two, the pet rock. This one's so stupid. It's just a rock, legit, that's all it is. A fad about buying a rock and naming it. Oftentimes, including those little googly eyes to make you believe it's alive because yeah, okay. It's a ridiculous invention, it has no use. However, what it actually is, is a lesson in great marketing. Something weird enough that can be marketed quite easily, sold at an affordable price, and something that is already familiar with the people everywhere. 
So it actually makes sense, even if it is a bad invention. And number one, uh, this one, it's just so true, the Segway. About 15 years ago, these bad boys were all the rage. Basically, it's an electric scooter on two wheels with a handle to lean forward and lean back, or perhaps reverse. While there was some success in malls and airports, there wasn't that many in public. The main reason? Well, it's no different than a scooter or a bike, really, and uh, well, it kind of feels like an attempt to reinvent the wheel when we don't need it. Also, in 2022, how many people do you know that have a Segway? Seriously. And if someone pulled up in a Segway to your hangout? It'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would be weird. Yeah.